Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Diggory Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Each week, I'll be joined by a guest. We'll impart our own sex wisdom, ask our own sex questions, and we'll go over all the things they don't teach you in school. To bring this all together, though, we'll need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. In this episode... We speak to Dr Janine David about testosterone. I think there's a lack of knowledge from patients, from men and from the healthcare professionals. I think it's a double issue, really. The pressure on healthcare providers to improve every aspect of our lives. Sexuality now is a very big part of quality of life and it's something that we really do need to be addressing. And Janine teaches us a new fact about the male anatomy. The way to the man's heart is through their penis. Quite literally, that is... (laughs) Hello and welcome to The Real Sex Education. I'm Digby Waite and as ever I'm joined by accredited sex and relationship therapist Kate Campbell. Hello mum. Hello Diggs. Every episode mum and I give a different aspect of sex and relationships a good going over and today it's back to biology class because we'll be talking about testosterone. Now I have to say doing my own research a lot of the downside of a, of a low testosterone you know they they surprise me but the thing I was most surprised about was learning that women have to carefully manage their levels too. Mm, yeah it's it's the testosterone that gives women their their sexual urges. Yeah and, and it's not just sexual stuff it's like how you feel, how you interact, your mood, things like that. I had no idea. And hopefully, if there's any women out there like me, they'll be like, I didn't even know I had testosterone, so this is mad. No, a lot of women don't realise they have any testosterone. And it's really, really interesting that all of the hormones in our bodies, are a, you need to be in careful balance. Mm. And you, you need all the boxes ticked and everything working well for us to feel okay. And, and a little bit out and the whole thing goes, woo. <laughs> How does it go? That's a technical term. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hear some more technical terms and let's hear more about testosterone with our very special guest, GP and men's health specialist, Dr. Janine David. Janine, how are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's our absolute pleasure. We're, we're so, so glad to have you on. So the thing we wanted to talk to you today, it's, it's perfect to have a men's sexual health expert on, is one of the main things we want to talk about was testosterone. What is testosterone? Okay, testosterone is the male hormone. So I suppose everyone sort of associates it, don't they, with building muscle and sexual dysfunction. And yes, it definitely is related to loss of libido, so loss of desire, and you do need it for decent erections. But really, it does far, far more than that. So it can help you feel okay from a mood point of view. It looks after your bones, your muscles, your cognition. It looks after a whole host of things. So testosterone is sort of the main male hormone, and it does far more than just build your muscle and make you look like Arnie. And I think that's really important to be aware of. It's not just about sex. It is, of course, about sex, and it's really important for a good sex life, but it's not just about sex. So what sort of things, if you have low amounts of testosterone, what are the sorts of effects of that? Okay, so the early signs would be things like the sexual things. So loss of desire, so not wanting to have sex as much as you used to. Mm -hmm. Then with respect to erections, perhaps loss of early morning erections, that's a big sign to look out for because that's a healthy thing. Your penis has erections all through the night and it's a sign of something's wrong when the penis doesn't have erections and you don't have early morning erections or any form of erectile dysfunction at all all of those things those are the sexual side of low testosterone that you'd want to go and speak to your doctor about but then there's the they're a bit more vague the other things but they're things like tiredness so just absolutely feeling exhausted not concentrating i've had a couple of guys that said oh you know they're struggling when they're driving and things you know that's not right you know you shouldn't be like that a lot of time um i see men and they sort of say oh they've lost their general oomph for life they don't have that zest for life that they once had younger men especially i see they get treated for depression so their mm. mood is low they're not concentrating they're irritable you know their wives often send them in and say look you've got to go and do something you're miserable you're irritable go and see the gp or whoever so a lot of time men present like that then that's sort of one cohort but then i mean, one of my main concerns is in the younger men where People don't think they should have a low testosterone and they often get treated with antidepressants, which will make their sexual problems worse. 
And I see them down the line having tried lots and lots of antidepressants. And it turns out, yeah, it's their testosterone's low. You can also get a low testosterone in men who exercise an awful lot. So a bit like you get these midlife crisis guys who go and do their iron men or this sort of thing. And their testosterone can be very low. A bit like women who exercise an awful lot, they stop their periods. It's a very similar sort of thing. And then the older men, men don't have a menopause as such. So with all women, you know, once they reach that certain age, every woman will have a menopause. Men won't. They'll have a gradual decline over the years, but it may not affect them symptomatically. So some men will get symptoms, but most men will be absolutely fine. So I break it down to the sexual things. So loss of desire, problems with erections, then mood changes. So feeling flat, feeling low, irritable, loss of concentration, and just generally feeling yeah, I'm not enjoying life anymore and I just can't be bothered to do stuff. All these things you'd want to go and have a chat with your GP about if you're really not feeling right. That said, it depends on lifestyle because lifestyle has a lot to do with your testosterone being not as good as it should be. Ooh, what, in what way? Yeah, you mentioned some of those lifestyle choices like exercising perhaps too much or a lot. What What other ways are there? Okay, so that's sort of the one extreme. So Mm. you've got your extreme athlete who will have a low testosterone. But on the other end of the scale, you've got your overweight guy um, who has a poor diet, smoke, drink, all this sort of thing, who's got that excess fat around the middle. They're the sort of guys that tend to have a low testosterone because it is very much linked with what we call metabolic syndrome, which is where you've got diabetes, you've got excess fat, you've got high blood pressure. All these things are linked with a low testosterone because when you've got a lot of fat around your tummy, your testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So you haven't got as much testosterone to use. And the trouble is these guys have usually got a low testosterone, so they don't feel motivated to go to the gym to change their diets because as I said earlier, they've got that loss of oomph of life. They can't really be bothered to do anything. So they don't then go and do much about it either. So it's almost a vicious circle. And these are the guys that won't go to the doctor. You know, they're probably not having much of a sex life. So it's affecting their wives, their families, because, you know, we know that sex creates intimacy. And, you know, they're just probably just sat on the couch, eating their pies, drinking their pint, watching the footy. And that's that's probably the, that of their life. And you think, well, you know, then you need to get them going and get them to be seen and helped, really. That's so interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of men won't because they're vague, non-specific symptoms. And so it's not necessarily the case that they'll put them all together. Or if they've only got one or two, might not think it's worth bothering, especially if it's embarrassing to go and see a doctor. Men tend to self-blame, don't they? They tend to think they're doing something wrong that's making this happen. Oh, yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think they don't always have all of those symptoms. So they may have some and not others you know I have men who don't have any of the sexual symptoms at all and their actions are perfectly fine but then they've got the other symptoms so it's going to affect Mm. people differently but I think it now really ought to be a screen for depression tired all the time you know we always screen for thyroid with these things or full blood cancer we check people aren't anemic this is the sort of thing we look at when we're thinking of that but testosterone screen ought to be in there for men as part of the workup, really, for that sort of thing. I mean, well, there, there seems to be a lot of men with testosterone lack at the moment. Is there more of, of that happening at the moment? Is, is there a reason for that? Well, I, th- I, I worry that we aren't picking this up in men. So I, I think, firstly, as GPs, I don't think we ask about sexual problems. We don't ask about erectile dysfunction. We don't ask about loss of desire. It's just not in our remit to take a sexual history. Even with diabetic men who often have erectile dysfunction and 50% of diabetic men roughly will have a low testosterone, we're not asking them. So I've done lots of research to show that we're not asking these guys and we should be. It is getting more out there, the testosterone deficiency. I think it has a bit of a bad press because in the States, Anyone who's anyone was treated with testosterone and they were kind of like the opposite of the UK. In the UK, we're not really checking testosterone enough. And I think men are slightly getting to know about it. So it's increasing a bit. 
but not as much as it should be. And we know it can really affect men's life in, in the future, you know, their morbidity, so their wellness. And in fact, it can affect their mortality, especially if they've got comorbidities mm -hmm. like obesity, diabetes, this sort of thing. So it is something we ought to really be picking up on. And we also know that men do not come to the doctor. This is still a problem. So men are unhealthier. Men die earlier than women on average about six years. And this difference in the life expectancy is continuing to grow because men just don't come. And that's for a combination of things. I think men aren't sort of exposed to going to the doctor because it sounds sexist, but Women tend to go for contraception, maternity care. There's much more screening programs for women. There's nothing apart from aneurysm screenings for men. So they don't have that thing to go. And I still think in this day and age, men think of health as a woman's thing and not being healthy as sort of a bit of a failure. And I think that still is in the mindset of men, despite there being campaigns to try oh. and change this. Oh, really? What, what kind of campaigns were there? So, you know, we are trying. There was a campaign where this was put on the back of the toilet doors in, you know, um, service stations that you often see. And there has been campaigns like that to try and educate men to say, come on, go to the doctor if you're not feeling well. And in Australia, they set up these things called men's sheds. So a bit like menopause cafes that we have here. And mm. I think that would be helpful here if we had a bit more men's sheds set up, you know, not not just mm. for testosterone, but, for, you know, we know that depression and suicide and all this is far worse in men. And it's good for men to have other men to talk to. And these sort of things are important. Mm. And making healthcare a bit more male friendly, because even... I, I, we probably don't have magazines in the waiting rooms anymore because of COVID. But, you know, when we used to, it was full of sort of good housekeeping and woman's own and cosmopolitan. And there's very few, you know, top gear magazines and stuff. It's just even little things like that. And men don't go to the pharmacists mm. as much as women. Well, actually, I think the average about in the 30 to 40 years, about 18 times a year, whereas men go about four times a year. So men haven't got exposure to healthcare as much as women so they're not as used to going and asking for things and it's quite general and across the board really mm. and that's wow. it we that's where we need to tackle it so men don't really access the health system as much but you're right testosterone deficiency is becoming more known amongst men and perhaps pretty more amongst the younger men because i think there's a bit more exposure in sort of men's health magazines websites this sort of thing so hopefully it will increase because it needs to. But I'd, I'd like it in sort of the older guys as well. That would be good. Is being picked up more rather than it's occurring more, you think? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's occurring more particularly. I think it is, yeah, being picked up more. Do you know anything about coronavirus and ED? Yeah, we know that men suffered worse and we think that it could well be due to a testosterone level because oh. a lot of the men that didn't do very well with this were the ones that I was telling you, uh, the men earlier, you know, the ones with the metabolic syndrome, the ones who are a bit mm. overweight, um, perhaps diabetic, this sort of thing. These are the guys that did not do very well with COVID. And it's possible that it's due to a slightly lower testosterone levels affecting your immune system. Good heavens. But I'd say it's same with women as well, because lower estrogen levels are probably associated with lack of decent immune response. So the postmenopausal women didn't do as well as women on HRT. So across the board, it's part of the reason perhaps why it affected the older age group was partly due to hormones. Wow. But research is still going on, obviously, with all this, but mm. it kind of makes sense. You know, men with low testosterone who've got this, as I keep saying, this metabolic syndrome, they tend to have more inflammatory responses going on. And that's never a good thing in the body. Mm. And it makes it harder to fight off diseases. It's not just men that have testosterone, is it? Though women no. have have testosterone too. Yes. And this is very important that women, if they've got symptoms, get the opportunity really to be given testosterone. But annoyingly, it's not licensed particularly for women. So there can be an issue. And menopause experts are really trying to encourage if women aren't right on HRT and they've still got libido issues or the similar sort of symptoms to men with the loss of concentration, feeling down, it may be that their testosterone is low and it's worth a trial of testosterone treatment in these women, especially the postmenopausal ones or women who've got premature ovarian failure for whatever reason they've had, you know, oophorectomies or they've had their ovaries removed early 
these mm. sort of women often benefit greatly from having testosterone, but there isn't a product for women. So women have to use the male one and we need a lot more. So we just need a little pea sized dollop. But, you know, it's it is not surmountable. We can sort this out. Because I think I think people imagine that testosterone is is the boy one, estrogen is the girl one. And like, that's it. But with women, isn't it 10 percent of the testosterone that men produce women yeah. produce that much yeah 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 I mean, it's, it's difficult to measure because we've right. got such lower lower amounts of mm. it and there aren't great guidelines as to what level is treatable in that but you just think well if people have got symptoms it's definitely worth the trial of testosterone you can measure testosterone levels in women mm. and we do but and we do treat postmenopausal women with testosterone indeed and what function does testosterone serve in a woman almost similar to men you yeah. need decent testosterone for sex drive and again the tiredness that you get possibly with menopause you know the tiredness yeah the same the loss of concentration the mm. feeling a bit down depressed this sort of thing there's a bit of an overlap with estrogen as well but if the sex drive has gone in women then it's definitely worth trying adding in a bit of testosterone mm. they do t they respond really well and i bet not many people know that because as i understood it the testosterone drops quite slowly over a number of years but people think oh my sex drive's gone completely and actually it's it's going much more slowly than you would think you're absolutely right yeah it does and i i just think people just think oh well it's just part of getting older that's that then that's that done and dusted that's sex life gone mm. but that's not the case and it doesn't have to be the case no it shouldn't be the case you know, I, I once, I'll, I'll go off on one about women's stuff you know, but women aren't treated well I don't think at menopause time you know they're just a lot of time they're just expected oh well you've dried up now off you go <laughs> that's the end of your sex life I've seen it yeah I've seen it people refer to gynecologists with dry vaginas and then you know they just said oh well you've got a bit of thrush that's that you know no give these women topical estrogen give them moisturizers mm. look at their testosterone you know th these women need help and you know it's about quality of life and I think it didn't used to be but sexuality now is a very big part of quality of life and it's something that we really do need to be addressing in men and women and one of the things with menopause is that, that i think women miss the peak when they ovulate so they feel really horny around that time and when that stops then they think oh right that's it everything's gone but actually they've still got libido but they just ha don't have the peak and when they miss the peak then they think oh god it's all gone that's it yeah and trying to explain actually no 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 it's all still there you just it's just a bit different and you know comparing it with being on the pill or being pregnant when you still have an interest in sex but not that peak it's really fascinating. I think I think other symptoms put people off sex, you know, hot flushes and sweats and things like that. Yeah. So then if they were to be seen and helped, what sort of, what would be done? Um, you know, obviously you mentioned in America, they'd be given testosterone, but what about, what about here? Here? Okay. So initially, I suppose you've got to see someone who knows about it. So you would have a blood test initially to diagnose testosterone deficiency. You need two blood tests and you need to have symptoms and signs but you need someone to pick it up. So if they aren't coming in, say, with your typical things like low sex drive, erectile issues, is anyone ever going to check a testosterone? And this is sort of my big bugbear at the moment, that the testosterone levels aren't being checked. There's another issue then that happens that if they are checked, the lab values, so the laboratory values across the country vary hugely. So what might be normal in one area isn't normal in another area for the labs. So we're trying really hard as the British Society of Sexual Medicine to go around and say, look, these are normal levels. These are abnormal levels. Use that rather than actual laboratory value so doctors know when to treat people and when to help them with their testosterone. So I quite often suggest that, that guys go off and, and have a testosterone check and yeah. a blood pressure check and yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah. But they they usually get one check and they say, yeah, levels are fine, bit low, but within normal limits. And I go, you've only had one test. Go back and ask for another one. Yeah. And that's such a, so de oh, just depressing. It is. It's frustrating. And the trouble is the initial test will be the total testosterone and often... I mean, this gets a bit more complicated biologically, but we, we need to look really at men's free testosterone, which is another test again. So I always say, look, if the level is between what I say is eight and 12 nanomoles per litre, 
So that's a borderline testosterone level. We'd want you to have a repeat a few weeks later to work out your free testosterone as well, because 98% of testosterone is bound to other things in the body. So a bit like it's in a bank. You haven't got free money to use if you want to use an analogy. You know, Mm. A lot of it is bound tightly to these other things. And if you've got more of these things binding your testosterone, you've got less testosterone than the body can use properly. So I mean, I'd be happy if people did actually just check a testosterone. That would be a start. Or asked about erections or ask people about their sex drive. If come in with their depressed, ask them, what you know, how's your erections? Are, what's your sex drive like? Mm. It's a tell, you know? Yeah. So is that is that the drawback? Is it that other health professionals don't know to ask these questions or they're reluctant to anyway because, you know, it's a bit awkward for them too? Or it seems inconsequential yeah i think i think there's a lack of knowledge from patients from men and from the healthcare professionals i think it's a double issue really Mm. both sides are causing a problem and it's often that because men you know not all men it's a sweeping statement but men on the whole aren't quite as good at communicating as women we call it sort of the door handle diagnosis you know as they go they'll have come in with something else because they're embarrassed and then as they're just going out the door they'll say oh could i just have some viagra mm. and then it's very difficult they've had their 10 minutes i can see how it happens that you know they'll just get given a script for Viagra, but really they should have been investigated properly for this with blood tests and stuff. And this is why I was a bit unkeen really about the Viagra Connect, the Viagra being available over the counter because these men aren't really getting checked properly. Mm. So it, it's just a matter of that we have to learn to ask men these things. And erectile dysfunction is indicative of so many conditions, isn't it? I mean, it can be the first sign of all sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so important to ask this because really, if you come in with a erectile dysfunction, you've got to rule out heart disease as a first line. Mm. So really, if somebody's presenting with erectile dysfunction, you know, the way to the man's heart is through their penis. And, you know, if they have an erectile dysfunction and it is hard to heart disease, you know, your penile arteries are smaller than your heart arteries and they're going to block first. So, yeah, your penis is going to break before your heart breaks. And it, there's only about a two or three year gap between the heart going wrong after the penis has gone wrong. So that really is a way in to help in the health of men in the future. Wow. Do you know, I want to put that on a badge. I would have put your penis will break before your heart breaks on a badge or a T-shirt or something. <laughs> just sounds... That does sound a bit dramatic emotionally, doesn't it? Your penis breaks before your I heart breaks. I love it. Breaks. Oh. I just love it. It's the it. way to the man's heart, isn't it? Through the penis. Quite literally, yeah. that is, you know? Quite literally, Yeah. So we touched on it briefly earlier, but I I want to go back to it. Let's say I'm a man and I have low testosterone and and I get it seen to. What sort of help am I going to get? Treatment involves gels or injections. So men vary depending on what they want to trial. And I usually say, look, you've got to have lifestyle advice depending on what the guys are like. But you have lifestyle advice and you can alter your testosterone by lifestyle advice alone. But often it's not enough to significantly increase your testosterone to improve symptoms. And often, as I said, these men often aren't very motivated to go and gym and change things either. So, But you've got to change your lifestyle. You've got to be healthy. You've got to exercise because that will improve your testosterone. So that would always be the first port of call. And then treatment is usually lifelong because... Once the hormones dropped, it's dropped. It's very difficult to get it to increase unless you can alter it by lifestyle. Okay, it can increase a certain percentage and then you're okay. But on the whole, you need to be on something for life and it will be either gel or an injection. You do have to be careful if you want to preserve fertility because when you take testosterone, it's called exogenously, so from the outside, it will knock off your own production Mm. and then you will stop your sperm production. So a bit like the depot injection, contraception in women, that will delay your periods coming back. With men, when you take testosterone, your fertility may take a while to come back and it can never be guaranteed that it would come back. So there are things that we can do about that, but Mm. um, that's something to bear in mind. But if fertility isn't an issue, then, yeah, we treat with testosterone in either a gel or an injection. And there's varying different injection forms you can have. The gel you apply daily, both are equally as good. And you have to be monitored. We monitor you at three, six and 12 months with blood tests. And then after that, you just get monitored annually with bloods and obviously symptom improvement to see how you've responded. 
Mm. And then my diabetics or people with metabolic syndrome or the larger guys, I usually monitor them with their waist circumference and their blood pressure and check their cholesterol levels, diabetes levels as well, because they can all improve actually with testosterone treatment. But it takes a long time to see improvements. With any hormone system in the body, you're looking at a minimum of three months to see improvements or to feel your improvements. And it can take up to a year for erections to come back. Mm. Perhaps sex drive takes six weeks or so, but yeah, erections can take up to a year. So you've got to think, I've got to give this a good trial and keep with it if you're going to go on to the treatment. Oh, wow, that's so hard. But what about us? What about people listening to this podcast who have been listening to this and might think, oh, maybe I need to get my testosterone levels checked or the healthcare professionals checking that stuff. What, what's your advice to, to us and them? Right. Try not to be embarrassed about talking about these things, because I think if you hopefully if you've got a doctor that if once you go and say it, they'll be pleased that you've said it. We know that 80 percent of men would like to be asked about erections, but only 20 percent of medical profession will ask about it. So perhaps you've got to take the onus on yourself, guys, and go out there and talk about your erections and go and see your doctor if you've got any of the symptoms that we discussed today. So my main thing would be men, go and see your doctors and talk about sex. And then if you do get treated, one of the big things is compliance. So staying on treatment and realising it is not an overnight fix, that you're in it for the long haul with respect to testosterone deficiency. You need to listen to your doctor and use the treatment daily or have the injections depending on which one you go on. So you must must try and keep with it because you will feel better, but it takes time and attend the monitoring as you're meant to. And then for the healthcare professionals out there, Ask men about erections, ask men about sex drive, and please consider checking testosterone levels if men present, if they're tired or low mood, not just if they present with erectile dysfunctions and loss of libido. That would be sort of how I'd like things to sort of improve for men, really. Well, your manifesto Mm -hmm. has my vote, is all I'm saying. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) definitely. Dr. Janine David, thank you so much for coming on. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you both. It's the mailbag, send Kate your queries to podcast at hatch.com. It's the mailbag, send Kate your queries, podcast at hatch with two C's. Hello there, I have a query for Kate. I would like to know when the real sex education mailbag starts. The real sex education mailbag starts right now. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Janine David. Ladies and gentlemen, please heed her advice and get checked out if you think you might be testosterone deficient further reading and watching list will as ever be in the show notes mum yes it's that time of the show that we open up our mailbox so listeners can put their questions to kate an accredited sex relationships therapist you can send them in to us on email to podcast at hatchet.com or dm us on instagram we're at real sex ed pod mum would you like our first question oh i'm excited as am i this one is from someone who would prefer to stay anonymous and they say I get sexually aroused when I breastfeed my child. What is wrong with me? Nothing wrong with you. That's normal. People don't talk about this. And so it's very surprising to a lot of of people when it happens. But it is normal. It quite often starts when the babies get teeth, actually. I'm not quite sure why, but it does seem to happen then, perhaps not so often at the beginning when you're first breastfeeding. So having had an experience that hasn't been a problem, suddenly... People start to experience arousal and think, gosh, something's gone very, very wrong. And then they want to wean their babies and things like that, which is a shame. And it is a reason that some people do wean. For some people, obviously, it happens right from the start. But for some people, it comes a bit later on. And so they think, OK, I'll, you know, the baby's had a bit of time. We'll wean. But you shouldn't really. I mean, if you're comfortable breastfeeding, if you're enjoying breastfeeding, then the arousal is just, you, you know, something that happens, something not to worry about just ignore it. The National Childbirth Trust has a good leaflet about it. Mm. And, you know, if you do actually talk to other mums, you'll probably find that that has happened to them as well. It is completely, completely 100% normal. I have have to say, this is going to sound awful, but I have thought that, like, isn't it the territory for 
that sort of thing, like sexual arousal. Because I mean, I mean, there's breasts are lot... very uh, full of nerve endings. You yeah. know, often yes, um, of course. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's not intentional arousal, is it? It's just yeah. happening. I mean, sometimes during a medical examination, like during a gynae examination, people have become aroused or even orgasmed. There's even evidence of things like that happening. So mm. it's not it's not happening because you're trying to, I mean, ar- mm, arouse mm. the person. It just happens. And obviously, a baby isn't. Baby is just getting breakfast, you know. Um, it's, so, so it is disconcerting. And personally, I wish people would talk about this sort of thing far more. There are so many things to do with pregnancy, birth, and babies that just don't get talked about, and they're all completely normal and natural. And this is a very good example of that. And it's a shame that people are upset when it happens and stop feeding their babies. Mm. So, anonymous, you are fine and normal. Keep breastfeeding. All good. We have another question here, mum. This one is from Ash and they ask, my partner and I have agreed that every three months we're going to have a chat about our relationship and how it's going. We're polyamorous, so it feels like a good idea, but the first one is coming up and I don't know what to say. Help. Um... That's interesting. I mean, I would say whatever the boundaries were that you put in place when you decided to have those conversations is where you need to go now to look at what those conversations were supposed to be about. I mean, if you're thinking the arrangement we have is working really well, I'm completely happy with it. I feel okay about it. Then that's what you would be saying, I guess. If there's something that you would like to change, then I would go in with I'd quite like it if we could do this or if this were different and this is why, what do you think? That's all you need. But if there isn't an issue and there's nothing to talk about, then perhaps just say that. But I mean, I think three months is actually quite a long time. I mean, for couples in general or for relationships in general, however many people are involved, it's sometimes helpful to have a chat more frequently than that, monthly or weekly, just so that you're all happy you know you're all getting on and you're not allowing anything to fester because people can just let things build up and hope the other person will notice there's something wrong and wait to be asked if there is but even then they'll say well you know what it is well you know I don't like to say that sort of thing and you you do need to be really clear about what you want and discuss it as soon as possible really so I mean be clear say what you want say why you want it and then negotiate I think obviously the optimum would be, you know, like you say, every week or just similar with having the talk with your kids. We often say it's not just one talk. It's lots of talks until the day you die. You know, that sort of thing. Mm. Similar with this, it's like in the perfect world, you and your partner would keep chatting and you'd be open and honest all the time. And it would be this like very fluid thing where you could just pick Mm. it up and drop it whenever. However, if that's a bit harder, what do you think about this idea of like, every three months and like setting aside a time because in, in a way actually that kind of goes what we say as well is like sometimes you need to set aside this time to actually be like right we're gonna have a serious conversation so I do think maybe three months is quite long mm. but I do think it's kind of an interesting idea that I'm kind of on board with well abs- absolutely I mean I think people should be constantly reviewing where they are I mean relationships are really hard work and we don't mm. acknowledge that enough we sort of go along with the happy ever after it all sort it if it's a proper relationship it'll sort itself out mm. it should just Mm. happen which is all nonsense you do have to work at it and you do have to have an opportunity to talk about things but we all have such busy lives so setting time aside regularly is a really good idea I mean three months is a long time because if you feel oh god when am I going to get a chance to say this am I going to have to wait three months or do I wait until I've trapped them in a car or the lift or something Mm. like that and then I can start talking about it and then when it comes to it they're talking about something else and how do I do this and Mm. I always try and encourage couples to sit down for a happy hour once a week Mm-hmm. which I think we've discussed before, which is a you know good opportunity to just put aside some time to think about what's going well and what isn't. And quite often when you do put aside those times, it is just, oh, you know, this is all right. This is OK. Thank you. This is great. Mm-hmm. And yeah. w- when you are talking to one another, try to be appreciative. I mean, just think you don't want to go and moan. You want to say it would be even better if I'd love it if rather than you don't mm-hmm. do this. I don't like that. One thing that someone said to me that I thought was really important is they were like, whenever you're having these conversations, remember, for the most part, you're on the same team. 
And exactly. it's so good to remember that. And exactly. I think it's, you know, it's silly. Sometimes like mantras and stuff before you do these things are, and affirmations and things are a bit lame and whatever. But I do think reminding yourself before you go into these conversations, we are on the same team really mm. helps because you can mm. constantly just center yourself with that and go, hang on a second, we're bickering or whatever. But actually, we're on the same team. I need to listen to them. Hopefully, mm. they'll listen to me and we'll come to some sort of arrangement. Mm. Being on the same team is so important. That is something absolutely to remember. And the other thing to remember when you're having conversations is if the world was about to end, would you still say the thing you're about to say? And if you wouldn't, don't say it. Those are two things that will save any relationship. Just those two. Those two (laughs) on their own. That's it. Oh, my word. (laughs) Oh, my word. We've given it all. Yeah. Um, Well, what a perfect place to end. That's all we have time for today. But thank you so much again to Dr. Janine David for coming on the show and speaking to us. Thanks ever to resident sex expert Kate Campbell and the wisest person in the world that can save your relationships with just two steps. <laughs> thank you, Mum. <laughs> Been lovely, Dicks. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time for some more real sex education. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Campbell. The show is produced by Diggory Waite and the executive producer is Claire Broughton. The Real Sex Education is a hat-trick podcast. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between Diggory Waite and his mother, accredited sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by, but otherwise unrelated to, the TV show Sex Education. But yes, Diggory does wish his mother was played by Gillian Anderson.